Welcome. Welcome. Housewives of true crime. Yeah, we're 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 back in action. We are. Yeah, are you still coming down from that eclipse? I mean, I think it made me a little wackadoo, by the way. Like, oh, okay. I okay, it was pretty freaking epic because we were right in the the heart of it, I guess, right? Mhm. But I don't know. I mean, then I got all nervous that I like looked at it too long without a glasses. And now I'm like, am I going to be scarred for life? I don't, I'm like, was it worth it? I had the glasses, but then I was trying to take a picture with my cell phone. And, and then I forgot my kid at school. I thought it was late day, but it wasn't. So I just think it made the moon and the stars in my yeah brain. I think so eclipses crazy. are balls I think we all need to get over it okay <laughs> yeah my kids they did it with them at school mm-hmm. you know they they had they got the glasses they still want to look at the sun so I think that's a problem I I don't think with the glasses or not you need to be looking at the sun at all also it's one of those things it's like parades for me okay we all act like they're great but they're not it's not that exciting, okay? <laughs> Mostly you're not. just hot, you're, so you're outside. Right. I didn't even get off my couch this time. I was not falling for it. Tab tried to get me pumped on this eclipse business. Well, it's not I was, happening for I me. I was where the line was, right? So we got full eclipse. But where you are, oh, I would not. No, have even, I was like, I'll I go in the bathroom not. and turn off the lights. <laughs> okay? <laughs> eclipse me. Although, you know what was really crazy? The um, crickets started chirping as soon as it went dark. Like all, like all of a sudden, all the animals and crickets were like, what? <laughs> it was really weird. But then it was like, actually, joke's on you, crickets. It's not nighttime. It's not. No. Nope. Also, I wanted to talk about, because we're recording on Thursday, and that is when our bonus episodes come out. And we had such a good one this week with uh, singer-songwriter Stephanie Quayle. And that you, I guess it was, it's last week, last Thursday is what you guys will know it as. And it is so good. So she wrote a book and she's an author. She's also a singer-songwriter. And um, she came to talk to us about it. And it's just a, an episode that I think everybody should go listen to. And so if you have Clink Clink Club on Apple, you can listen to it there. If you don't have it, then join or you can join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash housewives of true crime. Word. Word on the street. And also one more piece of business, okay? Actually, two more pieces of business. Sorry, I'm taking a minute. But somebody said something about how we talk. Well, we talk for seven minutes. So if you're a new listener, we have seven minutes of chit chat between us. Lots of people like it. Actually, I think the majority do, but if you are not one of them, we, we don't mind. Like you can fast forward your seven minutes and you can listen to the case and we, um, will forgive you. Also, uh, thank you all who have bought five crimes. This last week was amazing. You all are amazing and I hope you enjoy your products. If you haven't tried it, you can go to five crimes. That's F I V E crimes.com. And we have the best, um, five products for you and your skin and you will thank us later. Okay. That's all I got. Gretch. What about you? Okay. Well, I'm still coming back from Hawaii time, right? Mm. Get, how, getting... how is that sad? <laughs> yeah, it's sad. You yeah, know, the sun was out. I thought I was going to just carry out the summer, but you know what? It it's raining today. Oh no. Yeah. So, so that's not great. Uh, On the upside, well, up, let me tell you up and down, right? We all have our weight struggles and I don't normally like to fat shame, but, uh, I came home to one fat puppy. Oh, which on one hand was refreshing yeah, because last the last time, time I was eat. so worried about her the whole yeah. damn time I was in Hawaii because the last time I went, I left her and she came back to me skin and bones and right. you know it led to a couple weeks of trips going back and forth to the vet. She ate her way through missing me this time. <laughs> well, smarter. <laughs> She's a smart one. 
<laughs> that sounds way better in human world or dog world. Like oh, eating yeah. is always better. But you so, know, this time she was the first time she gave me a standoff. I have never, ever, you know, I'm obsessed with my dog because she just loves me so much unconditionally and just <laughs> runs to me. This time yes. when we came back, she just stared at me for like a minute mm -hmm. before she let me have the love in. She, she was wasn't like, happy. She was like, no, she was me for not whole, happy. Whole week, whole damn week. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, whole damn that's week. That's a lot. I also learned some valuable li life lessons um, while I was on my Hawaii trip. Like, I think I'm going to get pre check. Yeah, because right Dude. now how we roll is my husband gets to go through pre-check with all of our children and and can I you stand in line. Why yeah, and I stand in line and I'm always like, oh, my gosh, that was such a pain. You had to wait five whole minutes for me Woohoo! with your pre-check. So, you don't get to take off your shoes. Except Woo. at spring break in LAX. Yeah. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. Well, this was our flight from Waikiki to Kauai. Uh, Kauai. Yeah, so the Honolulu airport. Holy no balls. Okay. Yeah, get the It was such a long line, but it was like, okay, you know, I am prepared. Okay. I'm not like you. I get there plenty of time early. I like to have an airport drink. Okay. So I am in line. And right before I get to, you know, where you're putting your luggage through, they say, you got to go to the other side of, they tell a bunch of us, go to the other side of the airport. They're opening up another security oh checkpoint. Oh my gosh. I've done this before and I get there and it's so long. It's, it's not worth it. Never worth it. Uh, it. Okay. And that is what my gut told me is like, no, I shouldn't. Yeah. I shouldn't do it. I should stay firm. I need to get, I need to get through security. But I, I walked and it was far right? Yeah, All the way across it. the airport. I walked, it was far. And then we had to wait. And the whole time, you know, I'm by myself and I needed to chat. So I'm oh God, talking to the, the people that I... are around me, like all these couples, you know, <laughs> oh my God. and families with kids. I'm like, you guys, I think we made the wrong decision. I think we should have banded together and stayed. Oh we God. were so close. They did not find me amusing at all. I mean, there, I made one friend and I made a lot of um, enemies. Yeah, I don't want to because I they, I think the they thought me as rubbing it in. <laughs> but, <laughs> You're like I came with you. I just wanted like... to I just wanted to have this empathetic, you know, like just like a moment oh. between us that all just got screwed. Yeah. And then while I wait, I did still make my flight on time, and my husband is texting me things like, "Are you at the bar?" I'm like, <laughs> "F you, okay." <laughs> You're like, "I wish I was at the bar, asshole." I did make it, but I did Although not get fault. my airport drink. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. TSA okay. pre-check yeah. for you, even if you only fly once a year. Um, okay. Are you ready for the crime? I am. All righty, Gretchy. This case was brought to us by listener. It's a listener suggestion. She actually reached out to us on Instagram first, and then I don't think I was quick enough to reply. So she um, sent us an email and, you know, I love somebody that when they first don't succeed, they try, try again. That is like so oh, and it's very now. necessary. We are self-admitted space cadets when it comes to like, replying. Well, just today well, when you you were sending me something, I realized I didn't reply to your last text. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that last text was about the fact that I sent the wrong text to the wrong person. Oh, I know. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and I think the text that you sent was like about taxes. So that's kind of funny. Yeah. But seriously, if you guys have a suggestion and we haven't got to it or haven't got back to you, yeah. try, try again, try again, because yeah. there's just a lot of stuff coming through. And if we miss it, it's not because we do not appreciate you. Um, and we try to uh, get back to everybody. So anyways, listener, Laura Selhorst, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, but Laura S. is what I'm going to call you. She sent this in and she happens to live in the town that this happened in. And she like kind of lived through it. She was there when it happened. 
And it's stuck with her ever since, which I think happens to a lot of us when we are involved or even just kind of in the vicinity of a really horrific crime, right? Right. So the town we're headed this week is Reedsville, North Carolina. Okay. Familiar? No. Me neither. It's located between Virginia border and Greensville. There are about 14,500 residents, so pretty small. Rita Reedsville motto is live simply, think big, meaning it's a small town with big city opportunities, which, dude, sounds like so my jam. I like that. I yeah. do too. Outdoor enthusiasts flock there to enjoy the nearby Lake Reedsville, and houses are super affordable at like $200,000, Gretch. I think like your next vacation home after yours sells maybe is there. Okay. Or mine. I don't know. Sounds like a lovely place. So it was in Reedsville where Douglas French, who went by his middle name Troy, met LaDonna Ann Mosley. Which LaDonna, the name LaDonna, I really, I dig it. It sounds very, you know, like respect. It sounds like a movie star LaDon. or something. Bow down <laughs> to <laughs> LaDonna. <laughs> LaDonna. Yeah. Yeah. So they met in high school at Rockingham County High in the early 80s. At first, they were just friends. Troy was a junior and he was dating another girl. So, you know, LaDonna was just a freshman. So it was like his little buddy. Troy got a suspicious feeling that he was about to be dumped by his girlfriend. So he turned to his disco biscuit little buddy, LaDonna, for some advice. She was actually friends with his girlfriend, so she was like, sure, I'll talk to her. But then Troy noticed that LaDonna was actually the sweet, attractive one in the relationship. Well, that's nice. I know. She was cute. She had strawberry blonde hair. She was a cheerleader, softball player, and Troy started spending more and more time with LaDonna. Which eventually they would make it official and start dating later that year. And then they stayed together through Troy's senior year. After graduation, Troy went to the Navy and he left and went to Norfolk, Virginia, where he served as an air traffic controller. And these two stayed as boyfriend and girlfriend from a distance. Troy was real smitten with LaDonna. And I mean, who could blame him when he would go back to Reedsville, he would see her. He even escorted her in the homecoming court in 1983. And then when LaDonna graduated in 1984, she decided she was going to attend the university of North Carolina, Greensboro, but soon gave that up to marry Troy. They got married in 1985 on August 12th in Reedsville, and then they moved themselves to Norfolk, where Troy was stationed. Okay. After a few years, the couple decided they really did miss their family and their hometown, so Troy quit the Navy, and they moved their family back, or their family, it was just the two of them at the time, they moved back to North Carolina, where Troy decided he was not going to join his family's business, which was in the tobacco farming, Mm -hmm. which I thought to myself, that was an interesting business, right? It's like a very old school business, and maybe he thought to himself it was like on its way out. I don't know. Because I can feel, I, I mean, it seems like it is, right? Cigarettes. Well, yeah, like well, that's because we're not from there. But no, Tab, it is. It's a, it's a real thing. It's, it's huge. real. It's a real big deal out there. Still, still, yeah, I believe oh, it still. still is a real big deal. And I know that because I went to go see um, Leanne Morgan, one of my favorite comedians, mm-hmm. and she comes from tobacco farmers, and so she talks a lot about it. So basically, I'm an authority. Okay. Got it. So I could be wrong. <laughs> I believe you more than I believe myself. <laughs> I didn't That's really the basis look, of my knowledge. I didn't really yeah. look into it. I just know yeah. he was like, I'm not going to go into the tobacco business. I uh, want to be in the energy business. And he was hired at Duke Energy, where Troy would spend the next 22 years climbing the company ladder, which was like 
22 impressive. years. Impressive. One company is very impressive. LaDonna worked for an obstetrician in Greensboro, and in 1992, these, this couple would get some sweet news. LaDonna was pregnant. Her baby girl was born, Whitley, is what they named her, on October 29th, 1992, and then her baby brother, Hunter, would be born in 1997. That same year, uh, in 1997, they built a home on a 2.5-acre lot, which was gifted by LaDonna's parents, which sounds like all dreamy. It was also next door to her parents and other family members had like houses all around. So it was like a little compound, you know? Lots of babysitters. Sounds great. Sounds really, I mean, ideal. Yeah. Especially if you're going to have a bunch of kids. So Whitley and Hunter were active in sports. Whitley played soccer, softball, volleyball, basketball. Sounds like my kids. Hunter played baseball, swam. And was an active Boy Scout, not like my kids. We tried that Boy Scout thing. It it, it didn't. I it's kind of overrated, right? I think if you're into it and your kid's into it, then it's awesome. I think but it depends where you live, too. I think if I you think live so. in one of those outdoorsy areas where the, you know, the dads and the leaders are really familiar with, like, fishing Scouting. and archery <laughs> and all yeah. that, you know, kind of business, then it's cool. But... If you're like in Southern California, I think you just get like a coloring book. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Seemed pretty boring. I don't know. <laughs> but Troy and his son Hunter were really into it. Like he was going to like make it to Eagle Scout. That was the goal. And that was Troy's goal for Hunter because he always wished that he had done Eagle Scout. And then he dropped out before like everybody, I guess the Eagle Scouts are only like the top 6% of all Scouts make it that far. Yeah, I just, I have a hard time with putting that much effort towards being an Eagle Scout because there's nothing about the Scout uniform that is sexy at all. I know. And most uniforms are sexy. I mean, I even find, I find the UPS uniform sexy, (laughs) but something about the Scout uniform is like not doing anything for me. The opposite. I think that you're right about that UPS uniform. I oh, never yeah. thought about it, but oh, it is yeah. kind of cute. Yeah. Right? So you are so right. But yes, no, and the, the Boy Scout uniform is so dorky to me. <laughs> no, sorry. And sorry. <laughs> if you are a Boy Scout, I actually congratulate you. I don't even care that you're dorky. I'm sure if you're a, made uniform. it that far that you're an Eagle Scout, I'm sure you are a well-rounded individual with a sense of humor. True. Okay. <laughs> Not going to give us a one. Snaps. Story. Okay. So after graduating from Rockingham County High School, the same high school that her parents attended, Whitley made a decision to follow her boyfriend, John Alvarez, to attend Eastern Carolina University, which goes by ECU, instead of going to UNC, which was what her parents dreamt for her. Troy and LaDonna were diehard UNC fans, and not to mention, UNC was also only 30 minutes from their house, and ECU was over three hours away. Plus, Troy and LaDonna were also not super stoked on Whitley and John's relationship. LaDonna felt like John was, like, demeaning towards Whitley. They didn't share the same religious beliefs, so they kind of were like, eh, we're not sure. Hmm. You should be going where your boyfriend's going. But Whitley, like any teenager, or probably 99% of teenagers, she made her own decision and decided to move to ECU in January 2012, despite her parents' objections. There was some tension, and the rumor on the street is that the French's pulled financial support from Whitley because she wasn't going to UNC. Uh, They did pay for her furnishings for her apartment, and it seemed like as soon as she got there, they kind of lightened up on this, like, teen's love story. Okay. Whitley came home for her first visit from college on Friday, February 3rd, 2012, and it was just the three of them that weekend. Her brother, 14-year-old Hunter was away at a swim competition. Um, Normally, 
Troy and LaDonna would like follow Hunter to all of his competitions. But I think because Whitley was coming home that weekend, they stayed. And Troy was going to drive out with his mom the next day while Whitley and LaDonna hung out. Whitley and Troy and LaDonna made dinner that night at home. They went to the high school to watch the boys and girls basketball games and they got home around 1030 that night. Whitley went upstairs to her bedroom to watch some Netflix on her laptop, which by the way, we need to talk about. Maybe we'll talk about this on our Patreon. You had me watch an episode or a series on Max called Quiet on the Set. Oh my God. I, I'm like, I, I can't even. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about it on, um, Patreon. But Patreon, which we normally it's about kids in Hollywood. And normally we don't talk about kids like really at all. But I mean, they're all grown and talking about it now. So we'll talk about it a little because it's like so bananas. It's so bananas. And I think I I was thinking about it. I was like, well, it's a it's kind of a wake up call and it's a learning lesson. Um, So it's not us like diving into a, a yeah, a yeah. Crime against a child at the moment. It's. No, I think just... there's more to talk about. So, anyways, we will talk about that. Mm-hmm. But anyway, she went. So Whitley went up to watch some Netflix on her laptop, and then she fell asleep. Around one twenty-five in the morning, Whitley woke up to use the bathroom and went back to sleep. Then, sometime around two in the morning, Whitley woke back up as she heard something, like a floorboard creak. And then suddenly she felt the mattress sinking underneath her and realized somebody was on top of her and they had a knife. Whitley didn't know if it was a man or a woman. It was really dark. The person had a mask on and was wearing a hoodie. She just knew like she needed to get out of the situation. And so she started screaming. The intruder reached out with their hand to like quiet her. And then they cut her on her arm. Scary. At the same time, Troy and LaDonna heard her scream from downstairs and came running out of their bedroom. Oh, good. The person crawled off of Whitley and ran out of her bedroom to the staircase leading back down to the first floor. And Whitley was right by, like running behind him. When she got to the top of the staircase, she saw the intruder raise a gun and take aim at her mom, who was standing at the foyer by the front door. Whitley saw, like all she saw was just a bright flash of light and Donna throw up her hands to protect herself. The first bullet hit LaDonna on the wrist of her hand, you know, the one that she was holding up in front of her face. And then the intruder fired again, striking her on the shoulder. She was still standing. A third bullet would pierce her chest, and that's when she would fall to the ground. A fourth shot rang out, hitting LaDonna in the right side of her head, killing her instantly. She came to rest with her head against the front door. Troy was just a few feet away, standing in the living room when he saw his wife go down. He looked up and saw Whitley standing at the stairs and the intruder below her. And then the next bullet fired, struck Troy straight into the chest. Somehow he was able to turn and run towards the kitchen to the back of the house where he had a gun safe, but he only made it to the kitchen island when he fell. And then the intruder came down the rest of the stairs, stood over Troy and fired one more shot into his back. Then the intruder turned back towards Whitley, but for some reason did not fire the gun at her. Whitley made it to the bottom of the stairs near her mother's body when this intruder pushed LaDonna out of the way, unlocked the door, and then went out the front door. Whitley called 911 immediately at 2.12 in the morning, and when the operator picked up she was crying and she said please hurry my parents are shot as she relayed their location to the dispatcher she was like begging her dad on 911 call you know like where were you hit where were you hit um at the six minute mark 
in the call, she was, she told the dispatcher that she didn't think her dad had a pulse, but she was still doing CPR as the, you know, they guide you through that. Right. Right. Awful. After tending to her father, she went to LaDonna and realized the extent of her mother's wound screaming in the phone. I didn't know that she was shot in the head. It's like such a sad, sad. It sounds like a horror story scene. Like it that's does, what I right? picture always that like someone just on top of you and then the stairs and I know like this can't, that can't be real. That's. And then it's real. Yeah. Awful. Ugh. So first responders started rolling in with the emergency vehicles, lighting the road with flashing lights and sirens. And Whitley was taken to the hospital right away because she actually needed stitches for her arm. While investigators were looking over the crime scene, Outside of the massive amount of blood from the two bodies, investigators discovered one single drop of blood on the stair railing near where LaDonna's body was, and then four more drops higher on the stairs. They also picked up eight bullet casings that were from a nine millimeter handgun. Detectives located Troy's guns. Remember, I told you he had a gun safe and there was one missing. The missing gun was a nine millimeter handgun. Now they were wondering if Troy and LaDonna had actually been killed by their own gun. And after talking to some family members, they discovered that the gun actually had gone missing several months ago, but Troy never filed a police report, which I always am like, I guess you just don't get around to it. But are you like, who, who's, who's stealing my gun? That's a little bit concerning. Uh, it's more than a little bit concerning, Tab. That's a that's a little that's a lot concerning. Yes, it's a lot concerning. <laughs> I think if you're stealing somebody's gun, you're actually doing something to like wrong with that gun. You know, it's not like to go shoot some yeah, it's beer a gun. cans. My husband is still crying about. He thinks somebody stole his sunglasses out of our house. I mean, he cries about it all the time. He By wishes he could file a police report. <laughs> I think that somebody steals my sunglasses like every other day. <laughs> yeah. So, him and him and I both. Okay. He didn't file a missing gun report or whatever from the police. But so then the police started wondering if Whitley had actually shot her parents, right? right? There was a ton of drama over John Alvarez and Whitley's relationship, her choice of college, combined with the knowledge that there had been a strife over this like financial support by the French's to Whitley because she chose the wrong college. Um, so this information put a big spotlight on Whitley and John as the front runners and the suspects to this murder. Hunter also was looked at, but since he had a solid alibi for being at that swim meet, they dismissed him pretty early as a suspect. During the investigation, the police learned that the family kept spare key hidden under the deck. They swabbed that spare key for touch DNA, and the test came back indicating that there was some DNA that belonged to an unknown male not related to the French's on that key. Okay. The blood droplets on the handrails and stairs were also tested, but when the results came back in 2000, October 2012, the profile did not match anyone in the French's family or John Alvarez himself, right? They're like trying to see if it's him or Whitley or who. It was entered into various law enforcement's database, including CODIS, but no matches came up. And since traditional DNA testing failed, the next step was familial DNA testing. What this means is that the DNA would be evaluated to see if anybody matches like a relative. Right. The lab would first look at relatives in first order. That would be like a parent, child, or sibling. It took a full year for those test results to come back. And when they did, they were in for a shock. The familial DNA was a partial match to Whitley's boyfriend, John Alvarez. Partial. Partial. Yes, partial. The test indicated that the match was a second order relative, which would be like a grandparent, aunt, uncle, nephew, or a half sibling. 
I thought you were going to say like a scary twin or something. Then we were getting very horror movie. Oh gosh, right? <laughs> You're like, did you actually I watch Brain Down on Netflix? Twin. Yeah. No. No. As far as John Alvarez knew, he didn't have any half siblings, and John's parents, Jose and Elaine, were married on February 6, 1987. And two weeks after they were married, their oldest son, Jose Alvarez Jr., was born. John was born in 1992, and then they had two more sons in 2002 and 2009, which is a very long, like, 1992 to 2009 to be having children is is too long. It's too, too, long. <laughs> too, too damn long. It's a long time. Also, by the uh, way, this shit could happen to me and a lot of other people out there. You know why? Because if you've been listening long enough, you know, I went through the infertility and I gave up oh. the embryos for adoption after I was done. Yes. You know, three is as much as I could possibly handle. Yes. So let's yes. hope. Yes, this is actually true. <laughs> Fingers all, crossed. They are all humans. mentally stable, non-murdering people yes. that aren't going to frame the children that I have living with me. I hope so. I hope so. Okay, so John does not know. He's like, I don't have any half siblings. My parents have been married forever. They keep popping out kids. Since no one within the investigation fit that second order relative angle, the sheriff's office sent the DNA to Paraben Nano Labs, which is where the queen of genetic genealogy, Cece Moore, works. The results came back with three crucial pieces of information. One, the DNA was a Caucasian male who was half Latino. Two, the DNA came from someone who was related to Elaine Alvarez, who is the mother of John and the three brothers. And three, the DNA was not someone related to Jose Alvarez Sr. Okay. The genetic genealogy started searching for male relatives on Elaine's side of the family. It had to be either a half sibling to the Alvarez brother, an uncle, grandfather, or nephew. At the same time, in 2015, when all this is going down, three years after the murders, investigators collected samples of John's dad, Jose Sr., even though they knew that it wasn't him. I don't know why they did. And they also collected it from Jose Jr. Meanwhile, also in the same year, John and Whitley were married on May 16th, 2015. Tragedy has a way of bringing people together. I know. The couple honored Troy and LaDonna by including their photos and like on chairs, you know, like empty chairs that they would have sat in at, had they been alive. Hunter escorted his sister down the aisle in place of her dad. It was like a real beautiful ceremony. She was, she has the strawberry blonde hair, like her mom wearing a strapless wedding dress. She had five bridesmaids. I mean, it was like actually perfect. John also had five groomsmen, which included his brother, Jose Jr., and then a month after the wedding, in June 2015, the results came back from the genetic genealogy search. The drops of blood that, came, that were found on the handrail and the staircase um, after Troy and LaDonna were murdered were identified. The blood belonged to John Alvarez's older brother, Jose Alvarez Jr. Okay. Listen, I'm, I would be having a hard time walking down the aisle knowing that, like, let's just be clear about who the murderer was in your family and how tight you are with them before I'd be walking down the aisle. Right. Because right. that's real close. It's real close. And if you're keeping track of the DNA evidence here, the initial family yet familial testing showed that the blood belonged to a second order relative of John and a relative of his mother, Elaine. It meant that Jose Jr. was a half sibling and Jose Sr. was not Jose Jr.'s dad. 
Jose Jr. I'm kind of confused, I must okay. admit. <laughs> so they kept saying it's a half sibling and John's like, I don't have any half siblings. So oh, yeah. he's like, you know, okay. well, until this came out, it's like actually Elaine told Jose Sr. that it was his baby back in 19 whatever oh now i get Turns it out that is scandalous jose jr is not related to jose senior and jose jr is a bad seed yeah jose jr turned himself in on august 25th 2015 three and a half years after troy and Ladonna french were murdered damn he was charged with first degree murder um, the charges came with a maximum sentence of either death or life in prison without the possibility of parole. And not surprisingly, he was denied bond and held in the Rockingham County Jail where he awaited trial. Jose Jr. was known as someone that just kind of blended in. No one paid much attention to the guy. No one paid much attention to him when he was at high school. He just kind of was there after high school. Sounds like worked. Brian Kronberger, the Idaho murderer. Totally. Yes. No, scary. Actually. Say hi to ev- ev- everyone. Do everyone a favor so we don't go be getting murdered. And just just say nice to everyone. Be You know, say oh. hi to everyone. Girl, when I tell you also about this, this, you're going to be like, yeah, yeah something so after high school he went to work for his dad's landscaping company um and then at a like a local nursery even in the wedding pictures where you can see john he's just kind of in the background he's not you know he's just or not john sorry um jose jr he's just kind of a background guy so jose's first appearance in court was the following day and he was wearing, you know, the orange jumpsuit, shackles on his ankles, doing the prison shuffle. Um, the judge addressed him and said, you're charged with first degree murder of the deaths. And these come with big sentences. He ordered him to um, stay there without bond, wait his trial. But the trial would never take place because... Jose Alvarez Jr. gave a full confession to the murders. He confessed to the double murders and he said he saw Whitney's, I say Whitney because I have a friend, sorry, it's Whitley, Whitley's address on her driver's license. However, I did read somewhere else that he did some landscape work for them. So I'm not really sure how he got her address, but it was his brother's girlfriend. So not hard, right? Yeah. He found the spare key located under the deck and he took it and made a copy for himself before he returned the key underneath the deck. Then for the next six months leading up to the murders, he let himself into the house using the copied key. He was completely obsessed with the house, the layout, the way it looked, the way it smelled, the way it was so clean. He just like could not get enough of their house. The break-ins only lasted a few minutes at a time, but sometimes the family was home. Sometimes they were sleeping in their beds and he would just be looking at them. Gretchen. That is so creepy. So he stole the gun. Obvi. He stole the gun. Yes, obviously. But dude, could you even freaking imagine knowing that somebody like Hunter, okay, who's still alive, has to hear that some fucking creep has been looking at you sleep in the middle of the night. Like, oh. Oh, no, that would leave you shook forever. Forever. Yeah. Yes. He said he would watch them sleep. Even Hunter. During the, one of the break-ins, he stole, the, he stole Troy's 9 millimeter handgun. On the night of the murders, after he woke up, and I guess, like, I think the handgun was out because um, Troy and Hunter were out shooting in the backyard or something. So, on the night of the murders, after he woke up, Whitley, um, and he was, like, lying on top of her, he told the investigators that he was just trying to escape the house when Troy and LaDonna were at the end of the stairs, and he, like, freaked out. He switched from the knife to the handgun, and that's when he cut his hand. 
leaving those five drops of blood that would eventually tie him to the murders. And thankfully he did. Yeah. The Rockingham County Sheriff stated, you can run, but you cannot hide from your own DNA. And on July 8, 2016, Jose Alvarez Jr. was sentenced to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. Um, The sentences are served consecutively, but, you know, the judge said, Mr. Alvarez, you will die in prison. Uh, He apologized, stating he was all he could say was, I'm sorry, which, I mean, I don't know what you can say. So his motivation was not Whitley specific. It was, it was, he was obsessed with the whole family or was it really just her? I don't know because when he was going into the house all the time, it, she wasn't there. She was like at college. So I think he was obsessed maybe with her family, with the whole, like their whole facade or something, you know, like they, they had a maybe nice house. It was just house the excitement of like, breaking in. It could have been that also. And like who watches people sleep? I don't know. I think he's, a, I think he has some real issues. You know, it's real coincidental because we are um, recording this on Thursday, the 11th, that we are talking about a confessed double murderer and OJ Simpson died today. Oh my gosh. And I am like, I saw that before we started. Did we, could he have left a note? That would be just, uh, oh, that would be so satisfying. Oh gosh. He just died. So maybe we'll find it somewhere. I hope so. I mean, he could have at least just tell his kids, like, I'm really sorry, and I need to say this before I die so I could go to heaven. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that. Something. It's, it's, uh, I mean, what I read on TMZ, I just read it too, that his, you know, his kids were with him. Yeah. So I don't think he Listen, told them, maybe, or I think they would have bounced. Maybe, maybe he did tell them. I mean, oh. when you're seeing somebody die, it's like a very, it's hard. And yeah. so I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Or he took it he took it to his grave. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, so uh Hunter was only 14 when his parents were killed. The French's uh had stipulated that Lisa and Todd Moore, Troy's younger sister and brother-in-law would have custody of Hunter in the eventual like if they had died. Later, Hunter and his grandparents, Donald Mosley and Kathy Hayes, LaDonna's parents, petitioned to have custody. Custody was granted, but in 2014, it changed, and Hunter went to live with his aunt and uncle, Faye and Carl Stone, who lived next door to the house that he grew up in and that his parents died in. Hunter transferred from Rockingham County High School and then to a private school in Greensboro, where he played baseball, then he played golf. In 2015, Hunter fulfilled his dad's dream of completing his scouting journey and becoming an Eagle Scout. Did it. Uh, okay. He, I hope I hope you found someone that finds it real sexy, Hunter. Oh, I'm sure he did. He completed the project that he and his dad planned to help uh, with the help of his aunt and uncle. The project incorporated Troy and Hunter's love of sports and Rockingham County High School, where the Frenches met and fell in love 37 years earlier. Hunter's project was to build a heated ticket booth for the baseball team, and he wanted to do something to honor his parents, and he had a plaque dedicated there um, with the project uh, installed for that photo booth, or I said photo booth, ticket booth, at the Eagle Scout ceremony, Hunter pinned the Eagle Scout parent pins um, on his grandparents' lapels. And Whitley and John Alvarez are still together. And according to social media, Gretchy, they live very close to me in the Fort Worth, Texas. Oh. And she's a nurse. And she works at Cook's Children's Trauma Hospital, which is... It, you know, I God have been to her. that. I know. I have been to that Cook's Children's. That's where I was taking Kyla when she was like having all that, those issues, you know? Yeah. I was going to Dallas, to Fort Worth. I was like all over God's green earth trying to figure out what was wrong with this child. But um, I did go there too. So 
who knows i don't know exactly you where cross paths yeah, yeah so weird french's home was eventually foreclosed um it was sold in 2017 for 189,000 and then again in 2020 for 245 it's a real cute home still and then hunter i tried to find information on him but he keeps a super low profile um and according to someone real close to the source whitley and hunter are not close at all like don't even follow each other on social media so oh. there's something to that which i'm not sure about well it could be any number of things you know Family yes. business be messy in all kind of ways. It's true. It's true. So who knows? I don't know. Um, I tried to. He he seems like he's not really like a social media guy, anyways. So you know, I mean, if somebody, I, I could see my husband not even following me. <laughs> like he's not yeah. a social media guy, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. So so I would not be surprised if they're like your husband doesn't even follow you and be like, yeah, he doesn't. I mean. He has social media, but it's nothing he's super into. Yeah. So that's the story of LaDonna and Troy French. Okay. Well, good one. Good listener suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So again, if you want to hear more of us, Thursday listening pleasure, go to Patreon. If you need your hair to grow or your skin to feel amazing. Oh my God. Can I just tell you, I gave, you know, I do my own nails and then I just put on the, um, just the whipped body butter all over my hands, but I just left it on there, you know, without rubbing it in for like a minute. Uh -huh. They're like new hands, new hands, okay. people. The, the and whip, they smell amazing. I know. Oh my gosh. Okay. So the whipped body butter and the shower scrub smell the same. And yeah. it's like so good. And everybody comments on it. They're like, what is that? Are you wearing like, it's just, it's so subtle and. Cause it's light and fresh and clean. So, and because the yeah. five crimes products are not filled with the bad stuff. Junk. Yeah. It's, it's so um, yeah. all natural vegan. It's got the best ingredients for you, seriously. And um, the whip body butter, it, it comes in a smaller container, but it goes a long way. So, yeah. you know, don't use a lot. Use like a very little because a little goes a long way. Um, and the tanning drops are amazing. Yeah. I'm looking tan already. They really are perfection. They are. Okay. So go to fivecrimes.com if you want to get, uh, get going and supporting us. That's also one good way to do so. Also, please, please, please tell your friends about us. We would love to grow our podcast. And really the only way to grow is to have our listeners spread the love and please just join the bandwagon and tell your friends about us. We would really appreciate it. We would. And CrimeCon is right around the corner, <gasps> y'all. Please come. come. Please come. Please come. I'm getting so okay. excited. Somebody just asked us if um, they had like day passes and listen, they might not be selling the day passes right this minute, but they will, I promise you, if you cannot make the whole weekend, they will have day passes and we will be there. If you can buy the whole package, use our code housewives. It is worth it. If you can afford to go, um, it is something that you will enjoy. I promise you. Yeah. There's such good, the, just the people there are good. There's people there for good, finding cases, actually making progress. Very uplifting. So, yeah. you know, you would think, which is sounds kind of strange to say because it's all about crime, but it is, everybody's in it for, you know, for a good cause to raise awareness yeah. about something. Okay. Everyone is just very supportive of each other. It's just a very cool experience. It really is. It really is. So we hope to see you there. And it's like so soon. And we'll be there so, yes. drinking at night too. So just <laughs> And come. if you don't drink, we'll drink water with you. We will. We'll clink, yeah. clink, whatever. I, I'm back so. on the Red Bull. I'm a lot of fun. <laughs> I've been doing those drinks that we got. The um, 
Recess. Recess. Yeah, they're so, so good. So good. Okay. Anyways, clink, clink, y'all. Clink, clink. 